New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning, Lars Stiles is here, Rosenberg is here, and also Speaker of the City Council and Councilwoman Melissa Mark Viverito on the program representing wow, New Ebro, York City. Good job out of you. Really did that That's intro pretty good, right? Yeah. I'm really impressed. Now, how do I go from here? Do I say... Melissa. Melissa's fine. Yes. Uh, Miss Councilwoman? No. No. Melissa. Miss Speaker? Miss Speaker? Miss, that's a thing, right? That's a good thing, yeah. yeah. I like Miss Speaker. Miss Speaker. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, we reached out to you to have you up today because we are, um, and as everyone is here in New York City, uh, involved in the rebuild and our loved ones, family members, friends in Puerto Rico. Um, and I, first of all, love all the work that you do and the way that you speak out and the way that you're fearless and fierce about representing people. Love that. Um, I wanted to get from you because you've traveled down to Puerto Rico yes, at I this have, point. Yes, I have, twice. And your mother's still in Puerto Rico? Yes, yeah, she lives there, yes. In Bayamón? In Bayamón, that, yes, yeah. in Guaynabo. Uh, yes, Bayamón, Guaynabo, yes. Yes. Um, so what's, we know how horrific it looks and the scene, but we're getting so many Mixed messages, signals. There's a a boat hospital that's not mm-hmm. being used. There's mm-hmm. supplies not getting to people. There's volunteers and veterans on the ground that we're seeing videos put up of like, hey, we're in Aguadilla and there's there's a whole airport here and no one's coming to deliver. The uh, mayors are stealing supplies and they're not getting them to the... Like, what is the truth from what you saw and the people that you talked to that are credible? I think there's a mixture of all of that and and... You know, let's be very clear. We're still in rescue mode in Puerto Rico. You know, rebuilding obviously is, is happening, um, right, as we're clearing. But rescue mode is in place because mm. people are literally dying. And the response from this administration and this government has been repulsive and have really turned their back on the 3.4 U.S. citizens uh, that live in Puerto Rico. And we cannot overlook also the U.S. Virgin Islands, right? We have 100,000 U.S. citizens that live there right. uh, and still don't have power either. And so we are still in rescue mode. So the, 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 there are supplies on the island. There are a lot of volunteer brigades. There's a lot of local efforts that are in place of people in Puerto Rico coming together, helping their neighbors out, you know, clearing the roads, getting people medical attention. That's happening in terms of a volunteer capacity. And that work needs to be enhanced and supported. On the federal response, there are supplies uh, there are military personnel. There are relief workers there. I still say it's not enough. Uh, I think to their own uh, records, FEMA is saying they have about eighteen to 19,000 people on the ground. When we saw about 40,000 people on the ground in Florida after Irma, uh, obviously there's a big disparity. So there is issues of bureaucracy as anything of this magnitude. It is a huge catastrophe. And Puerto Rico is 100 miles by 35 miles. It's got rugged terrain. It's got mountainous areas. It's got remote areas that are difficult to access. And so getting the, 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 getting the supplies in a consistent manner to the areas that need it uh, has been inconsistent. And that's the challenge. And I also think part of it is because there aren't enough people on the ground to like consistently develop a r- routes and to, to get it out there. That's my personal op- opinion. So, and you know, we've we've obviously seen natural disaster before. Yes. Um, and flooding, even here when we had Superstorm mm-hmm. Sandy, yes. right? The amount of time it takes to get to people in need. There's always some lag and people would think and hope that things would be faster. Um, would you say that in what we're seeing in Puerto Rico, it's... It's um, it's exacerbated by the the verbal and kind of response of the of Trump and the administration and kind of how it's laissez faire and he's bringing up money when we're supposed to be saving lives and he's bringing up uh, uh, debt and these other things. Let's say that that didn't happen and he had more of a positive response. I'm sure on the ground there would still be a level of difficulty. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, but let's uh, two, a couple of things. I mean, FEMA has been around for a while. They've answered and, and responded to catastrophes in the past. This was a known catastrophe. It's not like an earthquake that suddenly like comes up. We and saw it coming. Happens. Complete shock. We right. had days to prepare. Right. We were, right. Uh, you know, all of us were watching as that graph yes. as the hurricane was inching closer to right. Puerto Rico. Everybody knew it was a Category 5. Everybody knew it was going to be a direct hit, that it would be cat- catastrophic. All of that was known. And there was no prep work, you know, from FEMA anticipating that. There could have been some supplies mm. or some communication. Uh, I think two weeks ago, we're already a month in, two weeks ago they were wow, they were promoting uh, they were promoting on their Twitter page that they ha- they were getting satellite phones to the mayors. Two weeks after the hurricane. Knowing the hurricane was coming, they could have gotten satellite phones to the mayors before, because that's what happened once the hurricane hit, communication was down. 
Uh, there was no way for mayors across the, the island to, like, communicate what they needed and what the level of, you know, of response was needed. Uh, and so that delayed, obviously, the attention that was provided. There were things that could have been done. There's a level of incompetence that has been demonstrated, and I believe it's benign neglect. And I believe it is because we are seen as second-class citizens. I know it's because we are people of color and that there is absolutely no urgency on the part of this president uh, to give the attention and focus to this issue that needs to happen. And he continues to go to golf, you know, and golfing every weekend while people are dying. Uh, and I think there was a, a reporter on one of the networks that said that at this point, every death is a preventable death. Uh, and so we are seeing real level of urgency continue to be, you know, it needs to be happen. It needs to uh, to be consistent. And uh, it's really deplorable what's happening. We, we like to ask here on the show often, what is the rub, right? Like, what is someone trying to gain? We know that the president, uh, we know the the dog whistling he's done, yes. the, the things that are clearly just uh, aimed to hurt people of color. Uh, we've, we've seen that, or people who are Muslim, or whatever it may be, right? But we also know that there's a business side of this that he's clearly been setting up from the very beginning when he tried to establish the debt conversation. And we were always trying to say, like, what is it? Is it about his friends on Wall Street getting in there to rebuild? Do you guys have or an angle? Or getting their bonds, those uh, triple exempt bonds yes. that they still want to collect on from Puerto Rico. Yeah, so do you guys have an angle that you specifically think he has beyond neglect, something sl more sinister where they really want to take advantage of the situation? That always happens. That's happened in New Orleans. That's happened in other areas where there have been catastrophes where people were displaced, didn't come back, and then what came in to replace it, right? So obviously on a tropical island like Puerto Rico, you know, and the concerns there are about real estate, the concerns there are about, uh, there has been some um, efforts made, not efforts, there have been some policies and laws that have been enacted in Puerto Rico to really give additional benefits uh, to those huge investors, you know, and, and having them pay less taxes on the island. So there has been an infusion of money from private interests, from the real estate interests. They've been buying up property left and right. This was happening before the hurricane. So now the concern is that that's going to be you know, put on steroids at this point, that people that may leave you know, and not come back, and then what happens to their houses? What happens to that property? So there is that, that's a legitimate issue and concern that we have to, that we have to um, be mindful of. And yes, I mean, I think part of it is you don't have the conversation about money, you don't have the conversations about, oh, they want everything handed to them. Mm -hmm. You don't have that conversation happening when he talks about Texas or when he talks about Florida. Uh, and so there is that element of bigotry and racism that is very, very clear. Uh, so there is the element of money, but I also think it really is the element that our, our lives aren't worth, right. right, and don't have equal worth. And that's very legitimate. Uh, and there's a level of ignorance. You know, when you hear some of the Republican Congress people, there was one that was being interviewed on CNN the other day, and he's like, well, you know, the taxpayers can't be left to have to pay for I'm, I'm sorry, we are taxpayers. People in Puerto Rico, despite what people may think, do pay taxes. People in Puerto Rico have had U.S. citizenship for 100 years. Uh, we have served with distinction and disproportionately in every major conflict that this country has engaged in. We have shed blood. Uh, and in, uh, as Congresswoman Nida Velasquez said last week in a hearing, she says in 1898, uh, Puerto Rico was invaded. Yes. Invaded, right? So the United States has to assume a level of responsibility too. And there's a moral obligation here. So there's a lot. And, and it's just been very trying for me, obviously. It's personal. My mother lives there. I love my island. Uh, and just the level of inequity uh, is just something that is unacceptable, and it's it's very painful. Um, being in uh, politics, this is what you studied since you got your master's in at Baruch, I think yes. it was, in public administration, and you've been. This is your path. This isn't something you're doing just because uh, you you want to be popular. Like you want to make a difference. I, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, did you anticipate um, this Trump thing? because it's tough to call it an administration for me or take it mm -hmm. serious. Did you anticipate this Trump thing being this bad? Yes. Wow. I mean, you okay. know, we, we all knew uh, that the man is a pathological liar. Well, you're, um, you grew up around New York, so you've known <laughs> yes. you know him for a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've been in New York since I was 18. I, I've seen this. And, and uh, we all knew. It was all there to see. We knew that, he was a, that he's a misogynist, uh, that he's a sexual predator, uh, we knew all the things that we know about him now. And he's a bigot and racist. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And we all knew that it was going to be bad and that democracy was going to be imperiled and that people of color were at risk. And when it comes to immigration reforms, when it comes to the Muslim ban, when it comes to ripping families apart uh, and, and spewing the lies that they spew about who we are, 
and because they want to say that immigrants are all rapists and liars and I'm sorry, rapists and criminals and out to hurt us when we know and the facts state that immigrants, documented or not, contribute positively to our communities, that integrating them into the fabric of our society makes us safer, you know? Um, so they're creating these divisions. It was it was just known. So it it uh, obviously the the sense of urgency is there, and now at you know with this with this added crisis in, in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, it's just really um, that racism and bigotry is right there on the sleeve. But we've seen it with Charlottesville and other things too. Uh, it's it's bad, and he's so insecure. I mean, the thought that an African American as President Obama could be smarter than him. You know, he's an intellectual, he's, you know, a constitutional scholar, he's put in all these laws and all these policies in place, and he is intent on undoing every single item of Obama's legacy, lets you know what a little man this guy right. is, uh, and how insecure in his, and how inferior he feels, and utilizing the power of the presidency, you know, to try to boost his ego, and we can't allow that to happen. Do you I'm remember, much, do you oh, remember sorry, that? I was going to say, no, I was going to add, wait, wait, do you remember that moment when they met? That horrible, like you couldn't even believe it moment. And he wouldn't make eye contact with Obama, and, but he was being such his like little bitch boy. Like he was like, he, like he was so excited to be in his presence to a certain extent, right? And that Obama was like, all right, like shaking his hand. And remember afterwards, he was like, the president was so gracious. He was, and you could tell he was desperate for his approval, but he never got it. He never got it, and by never getting it, he's now gonna basically destroy everything. And it's okay. like he's like a super. He's like a villain out of a, a Marvel movie. Let's be honest. Like that little biblical almost like character who will do everything that a small person does no matter who pays the price. And I feel like we're watching it literally in Puerto Rico. Like right. human lives pay the price because of this man's insecurity. Exactly. Yes, Very true. people are dying. But what can we do, Melissa? Because, I mean, sometimes I like we share emails from people who are there, our friends that are volunteering, and we see things that are being mismanaged. There's lack of communication. And, you know, I, I, we're participating locally and see how we can collect yeah. and... But what can we do? Because a lot of us feel hopeless. And I know, I know. And helpless. And yes, it's and overwhelming. Helpless. It really is. No, and I appreciate that. And I have to do, say two things. One is that once, one, one is the uh, incredible solidarity that we're getting, not only from within the Puerto Rican community, but from outside the Puerto Rican community. People that are donating items, people that are contributing money, you know, whatever they can afford. Uh, that's been incredibly uh, important to uplift the spirits of the Puerto Rican people. And on the ground in Puerto Rico, you know, you do have a innovation and creativity. You have entrepreneurship. You have organizations that have been doing grassroots work uh, that are literally out there saving lives and helping. We have to really strengthen them and support them and know that they that they that we have their back. So that's that's how important that's all happening. But we clearly cannot do this alone. So there is still the sense of having to put pressure on the administration about the moral obligation they have, and also putting that pressure on Congress and the Senate. So there are going to be a series of mobilizations to D.C. We really do need physically people to be present mm. because that does make a difference. We have to advocate for the debt to be taken care of. You know, Puerto Rico has to rebuild. And the focus has to be on, on the people that are there and rebuilding lives and rebuilding the economy and rebuilding the island. We can't be focused on having to pay Wall Street. We shouldn't be. And that should not be an issue at all. It should not be a conversation. That has to be eliminated. The issue of the Jones Act has to be eliminated. The inability of Puerto Rico to receive any sort of relief from any other countries, any neighboring islands that want to lend support, those ships cannot come into the ports of Puerto because Rico. Of the Jones Act, right, right, because of the Jones Act. That has to be, and it has contributed to the debt of Puerto Rico. Yes, it has. Because that has increased the costs of goods on the island. Mm. Uh, so that adds to the debt. So that has to be eliminated. So there's a lot of work on the administration, on the legal, on the you know congressional side that we have to do, and we need to build allies. So the lobbying does help. Engaging with elected officials does help. I mean, we have to show that Puerto Rico is not alone and that we're not going to let them kind of throw this on the wayside. This has to be front and center. Um, because uh, you're from there, your mother's still there, and I've always, you know, people who I know that uh, live in Puerto Rico, have property there, grew up there, have family there, I always talk to them about the Jones Act and why, you know, because isn't it, there's a maritime union there in Puerto Rico that's still between Puerto Rico and Florida, and they still make money off of that Jones. That's part of it, right? Like there's yes, some, a very powerful union mm -hmm. that has interest in keeping that alive, right? And and making money on that, right? Listen, I'm a strong labor supporter. I came, I come from the labor movement. I worked at 1199 at CIU, uh, but this law is outdated. And, and so that it just has needs to be, to be redone. It has to be, you know, we have to think about the future of, of Puerto Rico and we have to think about how this really handcuffs the island and its ability. 
you know, the law, Jones Act, my understanding, is also applicable to like a Florida and other coastal areas. But, you know, Florida can get relief from California, can get relief from Texas. Right. You know, they can get relief from other areas of the continental United States. Because Puerto Rico is an island, we're extremely limited in terms of how we can get goods onto the island. And also because of the the common or the Commonwealth relationship. Is that the deal or the... As a, as well, a, it's, because it's not a state, it's right. got to go through other... Well, that's the current status, you right. know, which obviously that's another conversation for another time. It's right. really intense, the, the issue of con having conversation about status. There are those that want statehood, those are the ones that want status an enhanced quo, commonwealth right, right. status, those that want independence, you know, and uh, but right now the issue is about helping Puerto Rico survive and how do we build a new future, right? How do we, what, as we start thinking about rebuilding, as we start envisioning what's next for Puerto Rico, we have to redo the way we think about Puerto Rico. We cannot build the electrical system the way it was built. We have to think about solar and sustainable energy. We got to think about supporting the entrepreneurial class, the young people, the innovation and the creativity that is there, that is fleeing the island right now, right? Because of the challenges that exist. That That's all. We, we can really um, reshape the reality of Puerto Rico in a way that houses, has us be more self-sustainable, and that's really critically important. Do you, um, the idea of the debt, right? How does that work in your mind? Because I don't know enough to even know. All I know is there's some guys who bought some triple exempt bonds on Puerto Rico. That was a part of the deal. They're federally exempt state, local exemptions. They're sitting on these bonds, and they want their money. Right, and they, and they have a responsibility because they're vulture funds. They came in, they came in with an express purpose. They bought these bonds at pennies on the dollar, and they want the full dollar in return. So they're vulture funds, you know? And so they have a responsibility because they knew what they were getting to into. The, com the, the, the Constitution of Puerto Rico indicates uh, that, and that's why they, they kind of decided to take this risk. The Constitution of Puerto Rico states that um, in the case of bonds and all that, the, the, the bondholders get paid first mm -hmm. ahead of anything else. So they take that, you know, and they use that as, you know, something right. that they can take to courts, et cetera. But they, go in, they went in knowing that Puerto Rico was in the state that it was in, that it was in a financial crisis. And they started, you know, dangling the money in front of, of, the, of, of the government. And the government took the bait and has put. There are those who claim that a lot of the percentage of the debt is unconstitutional, that it went against what the Constitution states. Um, and I've asked for an audit of the debt so that we can verify what percentage of that debt is actually unconstitutional, how much is real, uh, and that way start trying to chip away, right, at this $72 billion debt. It's, it's huge. Um, but right now, uh, you know, that, that has to be a focus for us, those of us in leadership positions. And the, the last thing I would just say is, and I really thank you for, for opening a space for this conversation, um, I think an element that people aren't really talking about is when you start thinking really on the ground about the economy of the, of the island right now, there are people that are not getting paid. There are jobs that have been lost. There are businesses that cannot reopen. Uh, so there is no flow of money into the island right now. And that's why people only see the only option is to leave, right, and to find a future somewhere else. And that's not how we're going to re rebuild our island. So that has to be taken into account. That's why grants are important. You have to be able to put money and flow people, you know, put money into people's pockets so that they can survive, one, uh, and to stabilize the island to some extent, you know. Uh, that that's an issue. I mean, there's a lot of of, of businesses that just will not be able to open. And well, and it also feels like the governor. It feels like the governor down there. The tone is not one where I mean, the governor. I don't. You know, he's a Republican. I don't know how that happened, but um, uh, he's technically he says he's not. He uh, says he's a Democrat, but he is. Uh, he believes in statehood for Puerto Rico. Uh, I consider him a Republican because if you look at some of the actions that he's taken, they've been anti-worker. They've been anti-LGBT, you know, and so he has enacted values that are more aligned with the Republican Party than the Democratic. I do agree with you, and I have a big difference of opinion with him. I don't think he has been forceful in standing up for the dignity of his people. He has not stood up and said, what President Trump is saying is wrong. I know and I believe in my people and I defend, you know, he, there's nothing of that. No conversation, no pushing back. More than anything, it's kind of bending over backwards. It's trying to stroke his ego, you know, trying to say, oh, that we're getting the help that we need. Between him and the, the resident commissioner who represents Puerto Rico in the U.S. Congress, who happens to be a Republican uh, and who happens to be a representative of the statehood party, um, they have gone out of their way to be overly gracious with this administration when all they have done is denigrate us 
and they have insulted us. And the only voice out there that is standing up for Puerto Rico right now is the mayor of San Juan, Carmen Yulín Cruz, uh, who they will not support because she represents a different party. Uh, so it is unfortunately, despite the fact that we're talking about people's lives here, politics always gets in the middle of it. And mm -hmm. it shouldn't. It shouldn't. But that is, um, a, a real, you know, people have to understand the political context in Puerto Rico, which is a little bit complicated. When, uh, when is it possible that people will be able to go back and visit Puerto Rico? Because you, you think, well, when could, w would it help the economy if people start planning trips to go back and spend money there? And like, how far away is, are we from that even being possible? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, the, obviously the tourism industry has been severely impacted. Um, there are literally hotels that are not online. Um, there's limited, you know, the, the number of rooms available have, have been limited. Uh, but there might be abilities for people to just go down there if they just want to spend money. That's, you know, that is helpful. Obviously, we are getting a lot of volunteers down there supporting and going into the more, re like you talked about the vets. There's these vets that are reporting. They're like going into the mountainous areas and yes. talking about, oh, right? I, yes. I forget their names, but I've been seeing that too. Mm. Uh, nurses that are volunteering, belong some unions, are going down there on their own, volunteering, going, doing wellness checks with people. You know, that's important, too. And and those volunteers, obviously, being on the island does help the economy, too. Uh, but, yeah. But at but, some point, you have to get back to what the what yeah. the main business of Puerto Rico has always been, right? I, I don't I just, see that. I mean, if in the times that I've been there, having grown up there and knowing Puerto Rico as a lush tropical island, when you go into these areas and you see all the trees down and you literally see the life having been sucked out of the vegetation, I mean, it is... It's it is traumatic. a horror show. It's yeah. It breaks your heart, you know? And El Junque, if anybody's been to El Junque yeah. and knows the only tropical rainforest in the U.S. forest system, you should see the images. It's heartbreaking. So the agriculture has been decimated. Um, and obviously that also has environmental impacts. you got no shade, right? You, you're you literally like almost more exposed. More mudslides um, too. Right? There's, a, there's torrential rain happening right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of flooding that is happening in very vulnerable communities. Areas in the mountains where are, there are mudslides um, and the roads literally are caving in in some areas because the, the earth is falling out under it. Mm. It's, it's serious. It's, it's not a joke. And it's, um, it's 3.4 million people. Uh, Melissa Mark Viverito is her name. She is the speaker of the city council. Yes. I got that right. <laughs> The New York City Council. There you go. And also a councilwoman, too. And um, anytime uh, you want to have a platform Thank to continue you. to have this discussion, because I think um, this is a what we're talking about is literally a generational shift. It is. And, you know. Um, it's a new reality. Yeah. You know, my mother, 70 years old, living in Puerto Rico, and she has to adjust to a whole new reality. And it's. It's hard, you know, especially for the senior population and for the young, I mean, for everybody. But obviously when you think about the younger generation and not seeing any hope and they are our future, you know, exiting and, and the mass exodus that is happening. Uh, going hear, to, is it for, true a thousand people are leaving a day? Is that the... I don't know the numbers, but it's a lot. I mean, there was this image. Oh, my God. It was, I forgot who put it on Twitter yesterday that they were at the airport in San Juan. And it was lining up. It was all people on wheelchairs. You know how people yeah. line up before everybody else? Literally, there were like 25 people in wheelchairs lined up to get on a flight. And it was the seniors that needed medical attention and needed to get out. It's horrifying. It really is. But even um, some families, like there was this one woman that I saw, they interviewed her. She said there was, her house was okay, but she has no water or food. Like literally living on like, chips and cheese and she's like that for dinner for a family of five so it's like even her house was okay they can't live right so she was leaving she was like i don't want to leave but she's like i have to i need a break i need a, a warm shower and i need a real meal for my children and then the you know lines for everything and you know the government puts up on its status page the status pr page that they have that 85 percent of the supermarkets are open but a lot there's of them have empty shelves yeah there's nothing know? in it and those that do have anything the lines are for hours and, and what people a, get desperate it's what, not what about um what about what i read about i don't know and listen it could be twitter but that fema had taken down the number of people of deaths are actually happening in the island they were taking down the, the fema was taking down information um from their page in terms of of any sort of status and they were kind of deflecting it and saying oh it was the government's responsibility to put that information out meaning the Puerto Pico government, and they were like, you know, let follow what they have on their status page. That's the most recent information. I mean, even the water, they're saying that 75% of people have access to water, but, you know, I'm what not sure. What do you mean by access? Meaning that, uh, that <laughs> right. So I, I don't believe in the quality mean? or that. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't right. drink the water, out, you yeah. know, out of the fountain at this point. You would have to do additional 
sterilization or boiling it, which they're telling people to do. I mean, it's it's a lot, a lot, a lot. Of, uh, to this hit is anybody. our first time meeting, so I've conducted this interview in a in my best uh, professional manner. But generally speaking, I can be a real um, a hole and very direct. And I've been honest since the beginning. Honestly, probably too soon, and people didn't want to hear it. Which is this is happening because these are people of color. Mm -hmm. These are black and brown people on this island. It's an island that, um, it's a beautiful island, but, um, you know, this continental United States has never taken that island seriously and always has taken advantage of the island. Yes. Um, and, you know, um, part of what we've seen over the last 10 years with Puerto Rico, when the pharmaceutical companies left because states started to give tax breaks to pharmaceutical companies, much of the industry in the middle class or upper middle class professional, what, over the last six years, what is it, half a million people left? There's been, there's, like, there's, yes, there's a lot of people doctors leaving. Yep. Doctors, teachers. Yes, the professional I mean, class. so this has been building for a long time, and that's why a minute ago I was saying this is a generational issue. This is something that doesn't get fixed next month, next mm -hmm. year, next 10 years. This is something that is really going to take a lot of time, and it's, it's um, I know for my Puerto Rican friends that have family there or even people that I know that are on the island, they, like we said, they they don't even know how to process what this means to their life yet. Like, to what degree, like, what is my life? Like, that's the kind of conversations people are having. Um, and, you know, we can continue to have the conversation, raise funds, but sometimes it feels like, what do you do? How can we help? You know, um, I've been asked to go down to the island. I don't, I don't want to just show up and look around at people no, helpless. No. Like, that feels like shit. Right. Like you don't want to just show up and like take photos of people living with no roofs. You want to put a roof on their fucking house. You know what I mean? Or, you know, where's... And that's and that's the anger that starts to build, yeah. right? Because you know that we have, we have the resources. You know, we have the people. We have the... As it, as it, we have the technology, right? You see, what, what was it? Um, Google wanted to go down and, and put up cell phone towers using... Balloons right. and Tesla wants to go in, um, and uh, uh, Elon Musk wants to go in and recreate the the electric. And then you start hearing all this political BS. If somebody has a solution, let's explore the solution. But it gets caught in all of the bureaucracy and all of the bullshit, and it gets yep. politicized. And true. people are like, I, I I don't know what to do with my life, and it's really frustrating. No, I agree. But I mean, there's there's great organizations that are doing efforts. You know, you could always link up with some of them. That was. I met a group when I was there last time that is providing filtration systems to different communities uh, and literally taking water out of the rivers, which people should not be drinking directly from the rivers or the streams, but taking it out, filtering it, you know, chlorinating it, putting it through an extra filter, and then it becomes drinkable water. Like doing that kind of stuff, which really does have an impact on people's lives, helping with the tarps. You know, there are, especially there's a low-income community uh, called El, El Caño Martin Peña in San Juan, uh, that is very vulnerable to flooding, has been severely flooded, but have has a lot of damage. A lot of the homes there have had the roofs pulled out. They're putting tarps on the roofs. I mean, there's great work on the ground. And sometimes just to cut through the bureaucracy and all that red tape is just go directly to these groups and say, look, I want to bring stuff. What can I bring you? And how can I help in the, you know, in the week that I'm going to be there? Do you post on your social media these this information for people to follow? I, I'm big on Twitter. I don't do any of the other stuff like Snapchat. I do Instagram and Twitter personally. So my stuff. And I really do post a lot of information on my Twitter in terms of, of in helpful information that I gather um, and groups. And I've been working with Hispanic Federation and uh, through the donations that they receive, they're going to be giving and pushing out all of those donations to the community uh, organizations on the ground. That's why I also wanted to visit some of these groups last time I was there and check up on my mother, obviously. Uh, and and so we're going to be doing that. So there, there's a lot of great groups, and we're going to provide a list at some point of all of those wonderful efforts that are happening. And what's your Instagram just for everybody watching right Instagram now? Instagram and Twitter is both the handle is M.M. Viverito. That's for my name. So Melissa Mark Viverito, M.M. Viverito. There it is. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank, Thank you so here, much. Thank so you for the platform. Right, and we'll keep working.